Welcome to another video from Lockdown Electronics with me, Bill. Now, if like me, you've lived through the 60s, the 70s, the 80s and the 90s for that matter, you're doubtless acutely aware that a lot of things that used to be commonplace uh, have now vanished. Um, and, you know, people who've been, you know, born in the last 30 odd years have no um, experience of them whatsoever. Examples for me include um, taking your film to the chemists and uh, patiently waiting a few days for the um, the pictures to come back. Um, unthinkable these days, just um, show people the image about a second after you've taken it on your mobile phone. Um, trains that have doors that um, have to be opened manually. In fact, um, you actually put the window down, put your arm out the door and undo the handle. Oh yeah, and of course uh, you can open them while the train's moving. Unthinkable these days commonplace uh, in the past. And the other thing that of course um, you may remember is light bulbs going with a pop when you switch them on. Mm. Very frustrating particularly when you've just come in or you're in a hurry and suddenly the uh, room is plunged into darkness. So um, if you're old enough to remember that hopefully uh, you're smiling wryly to yourself now. Uh, and it's that um, property of incandescent light bulbs that um, we're going to have a look at today. So let's start with um, with a bit of a trip down memory lane. Back in the 1970s, 80s and even 90s for that matter I was an avid reader of electronics magazines um, various sorts here in the UK. Um, everyday electronics I used to pretty much get there every month as I did hobby electronics occasionally practical electronics that was a bit too clever for me and just on the odd occasion I bought the television as well not that I understood very much uh, about what I was reading about but um, uh, I enjoyed it and certainly um, there were so many interesting adverts and you could dream of interesting things that you'd like to buy from some of these uh, some of these places but I digress um, now if you're thinking blimey he's organized he's kept all his magazines from all those years I wished I had um, sadly not um, but where I got them from is actually the publications archive as I call it which is worldradiohistory.com uh, it's an absolutely excellent website here's a grab of the top part of the front page I can't recommend this place this website more highly it's excellent well done to the people who've put time and effort into putting this together and also to the to the contributors because I'm guessing it's been quite a quite a team effort there's lots of publications here um, keep you uh, uh, busy lots of reading um, if you click on the United Kingdom icon it takes icon it takes you to um, at various sections in the modern era technology there's these magazines um, quite a few of which uh, I used to, to buy back in the day and uh, that's where I've got the the images from now I was looking through um, uh, a magazine from uh, the early 80s in this case it was uh, December 87 actually um, everyday electronics uh, incidentally one pound 20 back in December 87 if you do the inflation calculation uh, that would be £3.46 in in, uh, in today's money. I think most magazines here in the UK are well over £5, some, sometimes over £6 now. Um, so uh, in real terms of course they've uh, gone up a great deal more than just inflation. I guess that's probably um, a reflection of reduced um, circulation amounts as the hobby has become less popular uh, sadly. But why it caught my eye is that one of the projects on the front page there, the audio signal generator. Now if we look inside the magazine, here's the circuit diagram, and what caught my eye was the bulb on the left hand side, and I thought, gosh, fancy using a bulb as an indicator to say this thing switched on when it's battery powered. Uh, and actually if you look for more than a few seconds, it isn't a bulb to indicate that battery uh, that the power is switched on. You could use an LED for that, they were certainly available in, in 87. Um, it's actually being used as part of the feedback circuit in the op amp and we'll talk about why a little bit later on. Um, uh, also included in the article is this graph which looks at the um, the resistance of a filament lamp. So let's have a little a look a little more closely at that graph and what, uh, what, the, what it's all about. So According to the chart in the uh, magazine, if you uh, simply plotted 
um, current against voltage you'd get a straight line with a 200 ohm resistor as you can see as the dotted line there but the darker coloured line is the um, resistance they were getting for their bulb which was 12 volt um, 60 uh, milliamps uh, which is what was used in the circuit um, and what they're really doing is using it a bit like a, a thermistor in a way because the resistance um, increases as the bulb filament uh, warms up now um, I haven't got a 12 volt 60 milliamp bulb I'm afraid I've got various bulbs but none of them anything like that the nearest I'd got is a 12 volt automotive bulb which is a 12 volts uh, 10 watts actually um, it's a, a side light bulb as we might call it here in the UK so I plotted it um, and here's the results on Excel this is um, uh, volts up sorry it's ohms up the side and uh, volts along the bottom um, and what I've done is I measured uh, voltage in current and this is a plot of the calculated resistance using Ohm's law the little blip at the bottom uh, yeah I had two or three goes at measuring that and still got a similar result so maybe that's when the bulb starts to starts to warm up I don't know I can't explain it maybe somebody else can um, but as you can see once you get above about uh, 8 volts the resistance slowly increases and it does so not in a straight line it's definitely in, in a curve uh, which is the property which this um, circuit seeks to exploit out of interest um, current at 12 volts for that bulb is 0.6 amps um, and uh, that gives you your, your 10 watt bulb effectively at a resistance of 18 ohms um, current at 12 volts um, when you switch it on initially um, would be over one and a half amps um, momentarily the inrush current as it gets called these days and as I mentioned in the introduction um, that's why light bulbs used to pop when you switch them on um, because the inrush current was a great deal higher than um, than the operating current albeit happening uh, uh, momentarily so that's the property that uh, the circuit makes use of let's now have a look at a close look at the circuit uh, so what we've got is an LM386 op amp and it's uh, operating as a, an oscillator this is a beast of a, uh, an audio amplifier actually and produces plenty of power and certainly uh, output one on the right there for socket one is um, uh, uh, capable of producing a 6 volt um, peak to peak output which indeed it does actually now I'm not going to build the circuit with um, three sets of capacitors and those switches I simply I don't have them um, so I'm going to initially set it up with a 470 uh, nanofarad capacitors to set the uh, uh, the bias on VR1 and then I'm going to just put in a 47 in um, just for experimental purposes just to, to see how it runs and I won't bother with the um, lower part of the the outputs there I'm just interested to see if the thing works um, with a with a 12 volt bulb um, but what's going on with the bulb is that um, it's in the feedback circuit as you can see and as the feedback increases so the bulb warms up so the resistance increases so it uh, um, acts as a, a restraining force on the feedback if you like so it is working a little bit like a thermos thermistor but of course a, a 12 volt 60 milliamp bulb back in the 80s was very cheap and very freely available apparently thermistors at the time were about um, six pounds which was um yeah quite a lot of money back then when you think that the estimated cost of this project was 13 pounds um, adding a thermistor would have pretty much uh, doubled the price so good use of a bulb okay let's have a look at um, my version here on the breadboard and this uh, you can see I've got the 47 nanofarad capacitors fitted now um, and re uh, a setup resistor is on the left hand side which I've already set up when I took this picture um, the pot trim pot on the right hand side uh, allows me to simply vary the, the volume to the speaker which was, was quite useful and the two blue trim pots are my version of a gang trimmer which I don't have um, which isn't ideal but um, it uh, anyway it worked enough to, to illustrate the operation of the circuit so enough um, waffle let's go and have a look at that on the bench
Okay, here is the tungsten controlled oscillator then, as uh, described just now, sitting here on the bench, currently not powered up. Um, bulb off to the top there, I've just soldered a couple of wires to it so I can easily attach it to the breadboard. Um, now what I've done before um, I show you this, currently we've got the 47 nanofarad capacitors here. Uh, I actually put in 470Ns earlier on and preset the um, VR1 here to give me the, the output as per the description in the uh, magazine article. It, and uh, I think it was 2.1 volts and that's, uh, that's what I've been able to get so I won't... Uh, bother showing you that of course in the uh, article itself there was uh, in the well in the project as as described there's um, three position switches to allow you to switch um, three sets of capacitors in to give you the three ranges we're just showing one here and I've picked the middle one uh, because it's a uh, relatively easy audio frequency so project was designed to run off a PP3 battery I'm running it off uh, 9 volts on the bench power supply so let's power it up and hopefully you can hear that um, I'm just going to adjust the volume control here for you so you can hear it just in case you were struggling so you can see that's driving that speaker very well so just back that off a bit and then I think the final thing to show you is here we've got the ganged potentiometer um, and one is upside, one's the correct way up and that one's upside down so to operate these I have to do a, um, if you like, counter rotation of each, uh, of each trimmer so I'll attempt to do that for you, apologies for fingers being all over the picture so that's lowering the frequency and then if I go the opposite direction And there you go, so that's the um, oscillator working away um, and uh, actually uh, works rather well really. Uh, I think the only other, th other comment to make is of course that the bulb um, never, with the amount of current involved here, ever uh, visibly begins to glow, but clearly the resistance is changing and um, this bulb is roughly um, 10 times the, the capacity, if you like, of the that was used in the original circuit and it uh, certainly does the job because as you can see um, we've got uh, stable and controlled oscillation so there you go that's um, uh, signal generator tungsten controlled okay well there you go that's um, the uh, signal generator from uh, everyday electronics back in 1987 I quite enjoyed putting that together and um, it actually worked rather well um, I seem to recall that back in the 1780s, uh, 70s and 80s when I made things, uh, they didn't always work first time. I'm very pleased to say this did, amazingly. And it's nice that even all these years later it still surprises me when things work first time. Which they don't always, but hey. Thanks very much for watching. I look forward to seeing you on the next video.